Internets, what's up? This is Andrew, co-host here at Lost Origins. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode. I am so excited to jump back into our regular rhythm and just start getting some FaceTime with you guys on that weekly touch point. This week's episode is going to be cool because not only are we jumping back onto the regular schedule, back with the weekly episodes and whatnot, but we're bringing back a legend and a hitter from season one. I don't really want to live in a world where somebody doesn't know who Scott Walter is, but just in case you're one of the four people who hasn't really encountered his work in the wild, let me break you off a little bit on who we're going to be talking to today. Scott Walter is a forensic geologist who is most well known for his work surrounding the Kensington runestone. It's a pretty amazing artifact. If you're not familiar with it, throw open a new tab right now. Make sure that you're ready to jump down that rabbit hole because we are going to talk about it in today's episode. Scott also came onto the show in season one, in which we talked about the Kensington runestone, but we also talked about the enigmatic hooked X, and we also talked about the Knights Templar and their presence in America prior to Columbus discovering America in 1492. So today, we are so excited to bring him back onto the show to kick off season two as our first guest. Not only are we going to be talking about his work, his research, his theories, his upcoming book, but we're also going to talk about the reboot of his television series, America Unearthed. If you've not seen that, it is an amazing show that ran for three seasons on history before it was ultimately shelved after H2 was acquired. Travel Channel has recently renewed the show and they're getting ready to roll it out into the wild. And today we're going to talk with Scott about all things that you can expect when that bad boy drops. So without further ado, Let's jump into season two, episode two, with Scott Walter, America Unearthed Reboot. Off we go. favorite nerds are back at it again. Welcome to this week's episode of Lost Origins. I am Andrew Tuzon, and uh, I'm joined today in the studio by my co-host and partner in crime, Mr. Christopher Kingsley. Homie, how are you? Doing so well. And you? Good. I feel like I haven't seen you in a minute. It's, like, it's only been like a couple days. You in days, man. It's, it's weird. It's, yeah, I need to get my fix. Yeah. You need to hang out more, right? So psyched that we get to get this fix with Scott Walter. Yeah. Today's show is going to be really cool, man. I'm super excited for it. Um, this is how we ended season one was talking mm -hmm. with him and he's just a good dude, right? Like, so I had his wife on the show. I think it was like two or three episodes before we had him come on the show. And those two just really were open to like developing this relationship with me outside of the show. Like we had tons of emails back and forth. We've been on several phone calls. Like they're just good people and they're always down to talk about history and ideas and mysteries and just be like, supporters of the show. And, and so I'm, I'm really excited that we get to, you know, kind of close the circle here and bring him back on the show. So before we talk about today, we, we do got to throw some love to, to Inner Traditions and Baron Company. Our homies over there have just always, you know, had our back and, and they are, again, the, the main sponsor of the show. So many incredible things there. Yeah. Such cool stuff. They're, they're, they're always looking for just, you know, really interesting concepts, ideas, theories, and, and working with authors and researchers all over the world you know, whether they're, you know, seasoned veterans or, or first time authors, um, they're, they're always putting out just super high quality content. Um, so if you're, you know, looking for a rabbit hole to jump down and you need a weekend read, I'd say head over to innertraditions.com and just peruse that catalog because it's pretty deep, right? So, so deep. Yeah. Big fan of what they're doing. We've got nothing but love and adoration for our friends over there. Um, so thank you to Inner Traditions and Lost or Inner Traditions and Baron Company. I almost said Inner Traditions and Lost Origins. That's us, though. We're Lost Origins. He's uh, just foreshadowing some sort of uh, gigantic merger <laughs> at some point. I think so. I think that's what I meant to do, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So today, Monday, 
May 27th. Happy Memorial Day to everybody out there. And for all of our uh, veterans like who have served, uh, we thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. That's huge. That's awesome. So um, appreciate you and all of your families and the people that uh, keep this place what it is. Yeah. Much love. So happy Memorial Day to all of the listeners out there on the Internet. So, you know, one thing that we didn't really do last season is just kind of like poke at current events, right? Oh, and, man. Um, Uh-oh. We're both nerds. Uh-oh. And, you know, we got to kind of toe this line gracefully because, you know, if we throw spoilers out there, people going to find out where we live. Ooh, God. <laughs> so you're a Game of Thrones fan, right? I'm so glad he's going to be talking about Game of Thrones. I thought he was going to be talking about increasing Chinese trade tensions. But, yeah, no, Game of week. Thrones is so much better. Next week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Game wow. of Thrones, you're wow. a huge fan, right? Huge fan. It's like a decade of my life. Finally, it's finally closed. A truly incredible ride. And you've also read the books too, right? I have not read all of them. I've listened to Roy Detrice do uh, five of them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Inc- incredible narrator, Roy Detrice, yeah. for those who haven't listened to the audiobook. Yeah. The audiobook is, th- those are really well done. Um, and you know, the show is just incredible. And, uh, so without giving away any spoilers, <laughs> Whether dead or alive. Dragons are involved, guys. There are dragons. <laughs> we got done watching the show and my girlfriend, we, we watched the, the, the series finale and she was like, God, sorry about your dragon show. <laughs> sorry about your dragon <laughs> show, bro. <laughs> got to get your fire fixed somewhere else. Oh, yeah. So dead or alive, who's, who's, your, who's your character? Dead or alive, my character is Arya. Just hands Aria. down, what a total badass throughout the entire show, right? right? Throughout the entire arc uh, of the books. She just always struck me as somebody who had the deepest of convictions of any um, anyone who's in a, you know, noble house, anybody who's a wildling. It doesn't matter who it is. Like, nobody's got their eye on the prize mm-hmm. more than Arya Stark. Yeah. She knew what that end goal for her was, though, right? Like, she she knew that end game. Literally had a list. Yeah, for real. Spent seasons crossing names off that list. Right. I remember, I feel like I can talk about book two and say what happened there. Yeah, that's if, not a spoiler. If, if that's a spoiler. If someone's getting spoiled on book two, that's their fault. Yeah, that's your own fault. Yeah. Right? Grow up. Yeah, by the way, Ned Stark is dead. <laughs> <laughs> spoiler. Um, so I think it was book two or book three, um, you know, the Red Wedding and... Hmm. Um, when the Hound and Arya are bailing out of that situation. Yeah. And George R. R. Martin ends that chapter in a way that you, you think Arya dies. And I remember getting so pissed. I, I literally threw the book across. I was laying in bed and just like threw it. It hits the wall, wakes my daughter up. Like it was the whole thing. Um, yeah, you know, it ended up not being the case. But yeah, what, um, what an incredible growth story also. Oh my God. You know, to go yeah. from essentially... I wouldn't necessarily call her like a petulant brat, but essentially just like this young noble um, who had this pretty gilded life. But to, you know, spend years essentially becoming one of the most formidable assassins in all of Westeros and Easteros. She got skills. She's no joke. Yeah. You know, and to have somebody who's like a master uh, you know, swords, swordsman, swordswoman, mm-hmm. sword, swords person, master of sword, master of the sword. <laughs> um, and, and also just that, you know, you brought it up a moment ago that I think one of the more interesting and emotionally fulfilling parts of the show is to see the relationship between mm-hmm. Clegane and, you know, and Arya develop in, in this just deep respect. Yeah. You, you don't see the hound giving respect to really anybody else, even institutions themselves. Yeah. But he loves Arya Stark. Yeah, he will run through a brick wall of fire. Yeah, because she's her. that gangster. Right. And worth it. And he's my character. He is? Yes. What Clegane, a great segue. Uh, man, he, yeah, down. you teed me up. Break dude. it down. Um, he's hands down my favorite, right? Like, it, it, well, it's hard for me because there's a close second being Jamie Lannister. Uh-huh. Um, Love Jamie Lannister. Same. Uh, you know, like in the beginning, like the, the, the character development there is just beautiful, right? Where you, you hate him in the beginning. He's like, ew, icky guy. But like as the story progresses, you, you start to see how much of a good human and good duty is. And he's yeah. just like kind of been dealt a garbage hand. The and, things he does for love. Right. Dude. The things, the things he, does he does for love. For love. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like, you know, to a certain degree, uh, people who love the show are going to get just as much emotional torment out of the last few episodes of this season mm-hmm. um, as he is, you know, to the end of the show, exactly who you assume he's going to be. Yep. 
um, and just, you know, stands up for the things that he's stood up for the whole show. Yeah. Maybe there are some ancient mysteries within the Game of Thrones world that would warrant us having an episode with one of those experts. That could be hmm. fun. That could be interesting. Maybe entirely new podcast. Oh, my God. <laughs> They're pivoting. Um, yeah, we'll put a pin in that. We'll circle back. So um, one more talking point before we jump into today's show. Um, we have been working on kind of a secret project, um, the, the mobile app, right? Pretty awesome. It's pretty cool. So we, we kind of looked at it together today and, and just kind of the state of it. I'm really excited to roll this thing out. I mean, we haven't talked about it yet on social media or on the website or anything, um, but this application that we're developing for, for iOS and Android is not only going to give you access to, to the podcast episodes in one place, um, but it's more about community. Right. We're going to be able to have different functionality in there that allows people to put, like connect with us in real time when we're doing interviews. So that way, if they have questions, they can shoot them to us right when we're when we're interviewing that that individual, that researcher or author. Um, but then also having access to, to exclusive content, I think, is the, the key piece that really sets this thing apart. And whether or not it's, uh, you know, exclusive content that we're generating or writing or things we're, you know, tapping all of the, the broad network of Lost Origins experts out there, people have been on the podcast before, people are going to be on the podcast in the future, we'll try to generate that kind of content. But we also know that the listeners, the community are just filled with, uh, you know, just a lot of brilliance. There's a lot of research that's being done by so many of you. And to whatever degree we can help shed a light on that mm -hmm. or, you know, shine some um, some attention on some of the work you're doing or even just kind of playing around with some of the theories that are really interesting to you. Hopefully the app will be a great gateway for you. I think so too. I think it's going to be really cool to watch it evolve and just, you know, progress over iteration. And um, so, yeah, stay tuned on, on our social media feeds and, and on the website. We're going to be rolling out news on when that puppy is going to drop and hit the marketplaces. So, yeah, keep a weather eye out. New app. Yeah. Brum, 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 brum. Oh, we need a ham horn. We do need, it, yeah. we do need the ham horn. Maybe I'll roll that in post. That'd Word. be fun. <laughs> so, again, one more talking point before we jump into today's show. God, I should I should have done that better. Um, we're gonna play with a new segment today. Hey, -o. okay. So you know what? Let's not even tease it. Let's just jump right in. So we're trying something a little new here on the show. This is a new segment that we're calling Ask a Sixth Grader. So in the studio with us today, we have my daughter, Eden, who's Hi. 11. Hi, Eden. Hi. How are you? Good. So I'm excited to have you on the show, right? Like you've seen the show, you know, over the course of the last few years. Yes. Have you ever been on a podcast before? No, I have not. Are you nervous? Kind of. Kind of? Yeah. Oh, you don't need to be nervous. Okay. Okay. So for everybody out there that's listening, let's kind of give them some, you know, insight as to who you are. So your name's Eden. Um, yeah, my name is Eden. Um, I really like going outside. I rollerblade a lot. And... And how old are you? I'm 11. And you're and 11. I'm almost 12. You're almost 12. That's right. Mm -hmm. So do you like history, Eden? Yeah. Why do you like history? Because it's interesting to find out who, like, was in the past and stuff. Like, what I really like learning about is probably World War II and stuff. World War II? And aliens. And aliens? Nice. Do you know much about, like, ancient history? No. No? So, do you know, like, the pyramids of Giza? Mm -mm. No, in Egypt? You don't know the big pyramids? Well, I know those. You know, you know those pyramids? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, do you know much about those? Not really. No? I just... No, that I think they're made by the, what are they called, the people? Like the Egyptian pharaohs? Yeah, the Egyptian people. Yeah? Like the, like Cleopatra. I think that's her name. Like Cleopatra? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, do you know what the pyramids were used for? No. No? Wait, maybe to scare people away. To scare people away? Yeah. There's a lot of people out there that think that they're built to be tombs, like to to keep the pharaohs and different, you know, like to when they die, to bury them, essentially. Um, there's a lot of people that don't agree with that. There's a lot of people that think maybe they were built, um, you know, to be 
uh, markers or like to channel energy. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people that think they were like basically power plants, which is is kind of interesting, right? Like, mm-hmm. like to think that ancient people had electricity, right? When you think of ancient people, do you think of electricity? What do you think of when you think of ancient people? Like people that lived in caves a long time ago. People that lived in caves? Yeah, and like mummies. And mummies? Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think this is going to be super fun. I think we should be bringing you on the show more often and we can just kind of, you know, talk about history and talk about different things that Mm -hmm. you're learning about and stuff that you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this is good. So that was easy. That's so awesome. <laughs> so oh my she gosh. was so excited when when I told her that like this was going to be a thing. And, you know, she's she's seen the podcast, you know, be a part of our, our life and the home life for the last, you know, N number of years. And when I asked her, hey, do you want to come on the podcast and talk about nerd stuff? She just she lost it, man. It was cool. She's like, yeah, whose child am I? Of yeah. course, I'm, uh, <laughs> I eat nerd stuff for breakfast. Literally, that's the cereal we have at home. So I'm excited to see, you know, how that that continues to grow. And uh, if any of you guys out there have questions for Eden, hit us up. And I think it's so cool. You know, you spend your lifetime kind of uh, learning how not to respond to things or learning what questions not to ask or things that aren't interesting to other people. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about uh, smart young people is just that they're not afraid to ask questions, question everything. And, right. Um, so it's so cool to see things through that lens. Well, it's, it's that, but then also like the answers are just so pure mm-hmm. right yep. it's literally like this no this is this is what i believe yep. and it, yeah it's awesome yeah so it's it's so a lot great. of fun so okay today's show man let's dig into this thing we have uh scott walter on today's show uh i'm so excited for you to meet him first of all like he's just like i said such a good guy um but brilliant and his work is really really intriguing um he's got a pretty deep resume Right. So, I mean, I know you're familiar with the Kensington Runestone, the Hooked X. Um, That led him into doing three seasons with the History Channel with uh, America on Earth, which is one of my favorite shows. Absolutely love it. Um, That show has made a resurgence, which is really cool. Um, There was some transition with uh, the unloading of H2 and and maybe we'll get into that with Scott today. Um, But the show went dark for a while. And then Discovery bought travel um, and science. You know, it's, it's this like uh, family Huge of yes, family. It's this conglomerate yeah. now. Um, and travel has, you know, re-engaged Scott essentially to, to go out and, and continue to make the show. So that actually comes out, I believe, within the next week or two. Um, but yeah, you and I have seen episode one, which yeah. is super cool. So solid. Um, just so well done and, and really neat to, to see him back. You know, and it's just, you know, having somebody who's a forensic geologist, somebody who's, you know, got a degree in geology, somebody who spends their life around rocks. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we know he has a a professional business as well, having to do with uh, concrete analysis, mineral analysis. Right. But it's so cool to have somebody who devotes their expertise to really trying to dig deeper in things that, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the Near East, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, some Mm -hmm. of these traditional hotspots of uh, controversial uh, dating practices or, you know, deeper, longer histories, but to have somebody who's kind of like a modern day Indiana Jones, mm-hmm. um, almost like Nicolas Cage in National Treasure, you know, right. but somebody who does this for real in North America. Yeah, in our backyard. In our backyard. Um, he has a lab in Minnesota, travels around the world trying to substantiate these things, trying to figure out, you know, what, why did this culture appear here? What happened there? How did this get there? Right. So cool to see that happening in North America. It's so cool. And one of my biggest goals for today is to somehow convince Scott to come to Nebraska to have a beer with us. Yeah, I'm we got to look for that opening. Maybe we'll start doing some sort of other fossil digging on our own and just, uh, you know, get his interest. Yeah. Dig Scott, in. I found these old beer bottles in my in my backyard. <laughs> Can you come help us out? We'll figure it out. But we'll yeah, so out, yeah. I mean, the dude has, you know, several books out. I mean, he's been on, you know, several TV shows. He, I mean, he's just an amazing guy. So let's get him on the horn, dude. Let's do it. All right. Scott, how you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. I've uh, I've been busier than uh, what do they say? A one arm paper hanger. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good but, to hear uh, from you, man. Like it's it's been a while, and uh, you know, 
we ended our last season with you on the show. And I think it's only appropriate that, you know, the first interview of this season is, is, is with you. So thank you for making time for us today. Absolutely. So so your world's been crazy. You've been super busy. I've been trying to keep up with you online and, uh, you know, you got a lot of cool stuff going on right now. Before we jump into, you know, the changes, your work, America unearthed, uh, let's do a little bit of recap, a little bit of background. I don't want to live in a world where somebody doesn't know who Scott Walter is, but for like the two and a half people out there that, you know, maybe aren't familiar with your work, give us just a quick 35,000 foot view. Who are you? You know, what, what is the focus of your work? What got you to this point today? Hit us with a little bit of that, Scott. Sure. Just a little history. Okay. Well, um, uh, Scott Walter, uh, started, uh, Materials Forensic Laboratory about, mm, <clears throat> it's going to be uh, 30 years ago next year. But um, I, I run this uh, forensic business in St. Paul, Minnesota. It's called American Petrographic Services. It's a sister company to American Engineering and Testing. And basically what we do is uh, autopsies on concrete and rock. And uh, if there's low strength or fire damage or the top peels off, something goes wrong, uh, they will call us. They'll send us samples. We'll analyze them and, and tell them what mm-hmm. happened, and uh, and then we'll send them a bill. So <laughs> it works out, <laughs> works out pretty good. And, of course, a lot of the stuff we get involved in involves litigation. So I testify mm-hmm. as a witness, uh, expert witness in, in, in on different cases quite frequently, but that's sort of my day-to-day job that I still do. And I've, I've been doing as I've done America on earth, but back in 2000, uh, a very interesting controversial artifact came into our laboratory called the Kensington rune stone. Right. It's found in 1898 by a Swedish immigrant farmer who was clearing trees on his property. He tipped over this 25 to 30-year-old tree and tightly wrapped in the roots was this 202-pound stone with a long inscription carved in runes on it. And of course, it has been hotly debated for the last 120 years now. And I didn't know anything about the controversy. I didn't know that there was this uh, forbidden history, if you will. And um, I just went after the rock. and, And the question they wanted us to try to answer was, is it authentic or not. In other words, is the weathering of the inscription consistent with being, um, you know, 1362, the 14th century, or is it a hoax? And um, I I performed a pretty extensive study. I did a comparison of the weathering with tombstones, and, and I was able to conclude that the inscription is at least two centuries uh, and more than that old from the date it was pulled out of the ground because it hasn't been uh, in a weathering environment since it was discovered. Sure. And therefore, I concluded it was authentic. And that's when the trouble started. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, I was criticized and, and attacked for that. And I didn't really understand it at first because, you know, I was perfectly fine to answer questions uh, about the research that we'd done because for crying out loud, if I had made a mistake or something was wrong in our our data um, or analysis, I'm I'm happy to uh, take a look at it because it's not about me being right; it's about getting the right answer. But right. as it turns out, that's not what the issue was. They just didn't like the answer. And um, at first, I was confused, and and then I uh, I got a little agitated. And that led me to investigate the other aspects of the rune stone, including the runes, the dialect, the grammar, the dating, the history. And over the course of the next few years, I think uh, we were able to definitively prove who did it, where they came from, and most importantly, why. Yeah. And really what it does is it, it creates a completely different narrative of uh, the history of this country, this continent, and indeed the world. And uh, that research was um, noticed by a local production company here called Committee Films, who uh, approached me about doing a documentary that we eventually made about this research called um, Holy Grail in America. 
and that aired on History Channel. It did very well, and uh, we did another two-hour documentary and eventually came back and said, we would like to do a series uh, on this unknown history and all these artifacts. And um, that became America on Earth. Right, so, right. And so you did three seasons on history with that, right? We did three seasons on History Channel, and things were sailing along just great. And uh, and then they sold H2. Right. Uh, we were never canceled because of ratings. Our ratings were really good. But if you don't have a, a channel to deliver the content, you're kind of out of luck. So, right. So that's why we went off the air. But uh, thankfully, Travel Channel, uh, one of the executives over there, had always liked the show and wanted to bring it over to travel. It took about three years, but uh, here we are, and we are super excited to uh, to share the new uh, new episodes that we have. And I think you guys are going to like it. I think everyone's going to like it, and um, I can't wait to get started. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited that the show is you know coming back onto the air. Uh, I think it's amazing that, that you know, travel and the, and the science family uh, have picked it or the discovery family, excuse me, have picked it up and, yep. and they're, they're bringing it back to the masses. You know, your show, Scott, was one that I mean, I spent so much time just digging into that show, watching. It's one of my favorites. And I, I love the way that you explore things and, you know, you're not afraid to, to ask the questions. And so it's just it's, it's amazing to have the show you know, come, come back to life, so to speak. I'm, I'm really excited and happy for you. And Scott, what, what kinds of, what kinds of things do you think are going to change this season, uh, with the new network and maybe some different ideas? Are you going to do anything really different? Or are we kind of doing the kind of tried and true formula of the previous three seasons? Well, I think the tried and true, uh, formula, I mean, you know, if it, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Um, <laughs> right. And I, I think you'll 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 certainly recognize the show. It's it's going to be true to the original, but I also think you are going to see some subtle changes. Um, I just think everything has been ramped up a little bit. The production is better. The reenactments are great. I think I'm better, quite frankly, because I I, I know how to do this now, and uh, I'm not a professionally trained actor, as as obviously apparent in the show. <laughs> uh, I'm just playing me and. So I, but I'm more comfortable in, you know, doing it on television. And I think people are going to enjoy the fact that the interactions that I have with people, um, it's, it's real. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously they know that I'm coming and, um, but you know, it, 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 it's, it, the interactions I think are real and, and that's a little bit different than I think some shows. And I think that's one of our strengths. And quite frankly, sometimes it doesn't go well. I mean, you know, we don't right. always have a wonderful time with everybody. Sometimes people get a little bit um, funny with us. And, you know, I'm I'm going to stand my ground when necessary. But I'm an easy guy to get along with, you know. I'm not, For sure. I'm not a, not, not hard. But and I would agree with you, Scott. Like when, straight. Sure. I mean, I, I would agree with you, though. You know, we we've watched the first episode. You know, no spoilers, so so no worries there. But oh, I, you have seen it. I have seen it, yeah, it's awesome. It's so good. Um, good. And so, but I I do have to agree with you that you know the the interactions and conversations that you're having they 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 very much feel natural, natural, yeah, and real yeah. and organic. And you know, you can tell that you're you're very comfortable uh, and you're in a space that that you 100 percent belong. So you you crushed it, absolutely crushed it, Scott. <laughs> well, thank you. I I, I, I didn't know that, that others had seen it. I've watched this episode. And, you know, to be quite frank with you, when I first heard about this episode without having seen anything, um, I was a little like, Vikings in the desert, come on. Um, <laughs> but you know what? It, it, it really it works. And um, I'm just thrilled that, you know, it went the way it went. And I don't want to give anything away, but. Um, you know, these artifacts are legit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there have been many people who have said about past shows, well, gee, you never find anything. Are you kidding me? We find all kinds of stuff. And you certainly can't say that about this episode. Right. Uh, and, you know, the other thing I think that people enjoyed about the show, I certainly do because I love to travel, is we get around and we visit some really incredible places. You're going to see some amazing places in this first episode. It's, mm -hmm. it's just stunningly beautiful, the locations 
that I, um, I'm lucky enough to, uh, to visit. That's amazing. And before we jump into talking about, you know, just the, the new season holistically, let's, let's talk about episode one real quick, right? Like without giving away, you know, the, you know, the, the overall story and, and, you know, the, the, the cliffhanger or the, um, you know, like the, the final takeaway, no spoilers, basically is what I'm trying to say. Give us kind of a, a, a synopsis, right? Like, what can people expect in this first episode? I mean, you've already kind of touched on it, Vikings in, in Arizona. Um, yeah, just kind of give us the the high-level overview of that bad boy. Yeah, well, you know, it starts with um, uh, just, you know, just everyday people that contact me um, with some artifacts that actually um, this person's father uh, came into. And he had reached out to us at the end of season three about four years ago right? and wanted us to look into these. And we were planning on doing it back then, but unfortunately the show ended, right? Mm -hmm. And sadly, uh, this person passed away in the time. Uh, well, uh, 2017, about a, right? Pardon me? It was like 2017 when he passed away. Uh, 2017, yeah. about a year and a half, maybe almost two years ago. And so this is his son who's sort of carrying the ball for him. And we look at these artifacts. We talk to some experts um, that uh, give us reason to continue the, the the search. I mean, the fact is we've got these artifacts, and they uh, date to a certain time period. And the question is, how the heck did they get there? Right. Uh, were they really brought here by Vikings, or did they? Um, are they old artifacts that were? Uh, placed here uh, in in modern times, and so that's really what launches us into the episode, and um, <laughs> we go on one one heck of a journey, and uh, in, into Mexico, and I, you know, I never really thought about the plausibility of of, of an episode like this, but I have to say, as I went through the investigation, I was pleasantly surprised, and and we go through some, you know different routes to get to our our final conclusion and i think people are really going to enjoy the journey that we took it, it was pretty cool to see that you get to travel so much i, I don't know if that's going to be changing with uh, doing it on the travel channel but um some shows you know they kind of phone it in a little bit we're just going to do this and do that but you get to just get on a plane and go do the thing go speak with world experts it's pretty awesome yeah it's 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 wonderful and and no it's not going to change um, we go to Europe, um, we go to Canada, we go to Mexico a couple of different times in this season, as well as all over the country. So they're not afraid to, to put us on a plane, and I'm not afraid to go. I mean, <laughs> you know, if, if, there, if there's one thing I've learned uh, in all the years of doing research, um, every time I planned a trip to go somewhere, I always had an idea of what I was hoping to find or what I would accomplish. But every time I went, I, I you know, almost always found what I was looking for, but then there would be something else that was above and beyond what I was hoping for. Right. And, you know, that, that old saying, they say half of success is just showing up. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, you know, to actually go to these places, do the things, um, you know, it, it, you never know what you're going to find. And oftentimes what you'd hope you'd find, your expectations are exceeded. And that's happened to me many times. For sure. And I think what you really need to focus on maybe for the next season, Scott, is digging up an ancient mystery, maybe some some Viking artifacts uh, in, in eastern Nebraska. <laughs> that way CK and I can have a beer with you and we can check that bucket list uh, item off. You know what I mean? Like really just say we had a beer with Scott Walter like that's a good yeah, day yeah well listen if we get together I'd love to have a beer um <laughs> you know uh, uh, Nebraska there's there's a couple of well first off people need to watch the show and uh you know travel needs to give us another season that's that's something we're hoping for mm -hmm. so if that happens and knock wood that when we say that um there is one episode I would like to do that just might put us in that area so um, you know, hold off on that for now, but, uh, that beer might happen. Yeah. You keep us in the loop and we'll, uh, we'll show you around Lincoln. We'll show you a good time and we'll drink all the beers. It'll be good. 
That sounds good. And Scott, you you talk about how you know half of it is uh, showing up, and um, if I could, maybe the other half of it is a lifetime of studying forensic geology. Um, you know, potentially inventing a new discipline. And so can you talk about a little bit for those listeners that are not as familiar with your work outside of the Kensington Runestone, just to kind of catch people up, um, thinking about the hooked X that came from it, maybe some uncrypted code, uh, right, right. some of that other work, just to kind of bring people into some of the other areas to expect. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. Well, you will see some of what you just mentioned in this season. Um, we don't we don't dive into it as deep as I wanted to, but you know if if we get to do uh, more shows, we definitely will. But you know the Kensington Runestone is um, you know it's one of those enigmatic artifacts that has um, been hanging out there for over a century, 120 years now. And you know it's interesting. I've looked at many many artifacts, and what I've discovered is that. The fake stuff reveals itself quickly. You know, it doesn't take long for us to figure out, okay, this is this is BS, right? And but it's this it's the real stuff, the stuff that's authentic, that just doesn't seem to want to go away. Right. I mean, scholars and experts have, have tried to kill the Kensington runestone for a long time, and it just keeps hanging in there. And the reason is is because it's not fake. It's absolutely authentic. And you know, it, 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 there's so many pieces to the runestone, and one of them is the inscription. And, of course, you mentioned the hooked X. And that was this enigmatic character that confounded the scholars for over a century. But it was the geology, the weathering of the inscription, that told me it was real. You have to understand, I trust rocks, right? Yeah. <laughs> rocks. Rocks don't have egos. Rocks don't care. They don't have agendas. They just are. So I trust them. I don't trust some people. And so I knew that when it told me it was old and authentic, that means, that meant that there had to be um, a group that created it. They had to have come from some place and they had to have come for some reason. I mean, it, it, it that's just a fact, right? And so I thought that if I looked into those aspects, I might be able to figure that out. And indeed, I think I finally put it all together. Uh, I can answer all the questions now that, that the scholars could not. And it's not, and I don't want to say this in a way that makes me sound like I'm special, but I followed the logic. Um, I followed the evidence and I was able to figure it out. And the final piece to this puzzle really came together when I became a Freemason. And I learned about um, a different way of thinking. I learned about allegory, symbolism, codes, and all of that is embedded within the runestone. And it's the allegorical nature of much of the inscription that really was the problem for the scholars. They were trying to take it literally when it when it wasn't meant to be taken literally and becoming initiated in freemasonry helped me to understand that and really come to understand and appreciate what an amazing document this is and the monk that carved it how deeply initiated they were um and 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 the brilliance of ritual in, in within freemasonry and other traditions that in these rituals, there's real historical information preserved within them, as well as allegory, code, and symbolism. The difficult part is trying to figure out what's real and what's not. Sure. And, and it wasn't until I became initiated that I was able to, to finally understand that. And, th and that's a big part of my new book that's coming out, Cryptic Code. Mm -hmm. that I talk about and I reveal, and it's really the final piece to the Kensington Runestone mystery um, that really pulls everything together once and for all. And fortunately, I, I was right about most of the stuff I did before, um, but now, now I really 
have a, a, a greater understanding of it all. Does that make sense? A- absolutely. And and Scott, that, you bring up an interesting point that I, I was at least as a listener thinking about uh, at the end of last season when you brought up specifically that, you know, you've been initiated into the higher orders of Scottish Rite and, and Freemasonry. And one of the things that just popped into my head was, you know, since you've kind of made these connections and you've spent time digging a little bit deeper into the allegorical aspects of this to moving away from the literal, have you had any pushback from the Freemasonry community in North America? Have you had anybody um, kind of say, hey, you know, Scott, we need you to keep that uh, quiet or, hey, uh, you should look at this text or, hey, this is also interesting. Ha- has the community you know, reached out to you at all or, or been a part of this as well? Has, has there been any development there? Absolutely. And um, it has been overwhelmingly supportive and positive. And, um, you know, when, when you're when you're part of Freemasonry, one of the things that I've really enjoyed is you're dealing with a, a, to almost an ex, you know a total degree of people that are like minded in so many ways. I mean, you've you know obviously you've shared a common experience, that's right? As you go through these rituals, um, they're very moving, they're very impactful, sure. um, and they affect people in different ways. But there are certain common threads that are universal. So you are at a certain level with these people that you just aren't with other people that haven't gone through it. And that's not a, you know, saying there's anything wrong with these other people. They just don't have that experience. Sure. And so part of that is, you know, being open and honest and uh, respectful of, uh, of your brothers, right? And so if, 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 and there have been some times when, um, you know, maybe I, I said something that wasn't appropriate or, or, or you know, it, it, they don't get after you or get in your grill. They say, uh, you know, brother, you might want to consider this, or we call it whispering in a brother's ear if, if there's something that maybe they're off track on something. I mean, I've had very few whispers. In fact, I've had most people that have been extremely supportive. They have offered uh, critiques. Uh, they've added added to the research. Um, generally, um, Freemasonry has been overwhelmingly supportive. Once in a while, you get somebody who says, well, I don't know if I agree with that, but um, that's been few and far between. Over Overwhelmingly, it's been supportive. That's awesome. I think it's really cool that there's a community that you're able to, to tap into that has your back on a level like that, Scott. I mean, that's just that kind of support is is monumental, right? So, yeah, Oh, ab- absolutely. And um, you know, there are guys that have been Masons a heck of a lot longer than I have. In sure. fact, most of the guys I know have been in it longer than I have. And uh, I really lean on them. And I appreciate uh, their knowledge, their experience. And, um, you know, I, I, you know I'm, not a, I'm not a young guy anymore. And there's a lot of things in life <laughs> that I feel pretty, pretty comfortable about. But, you know, I'm still a neophyte when it comes to Freemasonry and I know my place and uh, I, I, I know, and I, I love the fact there are a lot of guys that I can learn from. And so believe me, I'm not shy about tapping their knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Truth <laughs> bombs from Scott Walter, everybody right there. Um, Scott, I do want to go back to uh, episode one of the new season as it relates to, to Vikings in Arizona. Um, I've got a couple questions that I, that I just kind of want to pick your brain on. We do got to take a quick break. So sure. when we hop back in, let's uh, let's unpack that a little bit. So um, everybody out there, we appreciate you tuning in so far. A conversation with Scott Walter. Stay tuned, and we will be right back.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our conversation with the one and only Scott Walter. CK, how you doing so far? Doing so well. I like that I caught you like right in the Mid middle drink. of a swig. But uh, already <laughs> so much interesting stuff, Scott. Thank you so much. So, Scott, I, I, I got to ask you. So, you know, watching that first episode of the new season, the focus is, you know, Vikings having a presence in Arizona and, and just, you know, Western United States in general. Based on your work, your research, this is the farthest west that you've ever seen evidence of, of that group, like having a presence, correct? Yeah. Um, well, hold on. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I will tell you this. There is another uh, scenario or situation that I'm aware of that I actually wrote about in my book, um, Akhenaten of the Founding Fathers. Sure. And that is in Panama, there are these, what they call white Indians that live in the mountains. They were actually driven into the mountains. And in the 19, late 1920s, three of these young white Indians were brought to Washington, D.C. and were studied. And one of the things that they determined was these young white natives spoke a derivative of Old Norse. What? That's, yeah. That's yeah. So interesting. I, in Panama. <laughs> in Panama. Yes, in Panama. Um, if you're interested in reading about this, there's a book out there. It's called The White Indians of Darien, written by Richard O. Marsh. And the book is fascinating. When I read it, I'm like, are you kidding me? Now, we don't know that they were Vikings. They spoke a derivative of Old Norse. Mm -hmm. They could also have been Scottish Templars. Okay. Okay. So, so, so I'll definitely have to check that book out. And I think maybe we link that in the show notes too. So that way it's easy for people to, to track it down. So Yeah. And what's cool about it is Marsh was sent down to Panama, his original mission. He was sent by Henry Ford and uh, I think it's Roy Firestone in the 1920s to look into purchasing land so they could grow and uh, process their own rubber plants for tires. Hmm. So that's the reason he was down in Panama, in a tropical environment. And it was during his uh, expedition into the jungle that he came across these white Indians. I won't say any more than that. It's a fascinating book. Um, and what happened to him um, on his uh, second trip when he interacted with the, the natives and the chiefs of the various tribes that were uh, having problems with the Panamanian government, he actually helped them. Um, and it's a great story. And it led to a trial on an American ship. And uh, it's just a great story. I don't want to give it away. No, I'm, I'm going to dig in for sure. Yeah, I'm going to scoop that thing up and uh, dig in voraciously. So. But outside of Central America and thinking about, um, you know, up in North America, is this the furthest west on the North American continent outside of Central America that you've seen uh, artifacts of this quality um, that that far west before? To my knowledge, yes. Yes. And I, I'd probably know if there were some other sure. examples. Yeah. But if there aren't, please tell me. But yeah, to my knowledge, I think that's 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 far and away the farthest west. That's awesome. So of all the evidence that you've seen, Scott, regarding just Vikings in North America, if you had to pick one, like one compelling piece that you could label as the smoking gun that potentially forces us to have to, you know, rewrite some history books, what does that piece look like for Scott Walter? Are you talking about from uh, the Vikings or just anything? Anything. Anything from the old world, right? Well, the Kensington Runestone. I mean, the Kensington Runestone, I mean, in a nutshell, was the land claim that was placed in the ground by the Templars not long after the put down that really served as the true beginning of the founding of this country. Mm -hmm. And our founding fathers, who were all Freemasons and Masonic Knights Templar, um, finished the job. Um, I'm 100% confident they were aware of the runestone. And, of course, a lot of people say, well, if it's a land claim, why didn't they dig it up and claim it? And the reason I say is because they didn't have to, because our founding fathers finished the job. 
And quite, quite frankly, guys, what I find astonishing is how no one has ever talked about this, at least to my knowledge, about the obvious parallels between the persecution of the Knights Templar by the monarchs of Europe, right? Right. And the Roman Catholic Church, and how two of the main tenets of the founding of this country were based upon, one, <laughs> freedom from tyranny of the monarchs of Europe. Last I checked, the Revolutionary War <laughs> was fought against the King of England, right? Right. And freedom of religion, uh, most notably because the Templars um, and even a lot of these people that came to this country early on during contact were being persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. Do you see any parallels there? Right. So why do you think that nobody's like poking that bear? Like why why is that almost off limits? What do you what do well, you think? Well, because first of all, the church still has a lot of power and influence, especially in the early part of the founding of this country. Mm-hmm. Um, so they certainly don't want this story to come out. Um, and uh, uh, and on top of that, you've got the persecution of the Native Americans who were not Christian, right? Who were savages. Mm-hmm. I mean, they use the age old uh, technique of labeling a group of people, something derogative to justify persecuting them. And right. there's no question that that's what happened in the founding of this country. The, the word is genocide. And I think at some point, somebody in this country, uh, preferably the president, needs to stand up and acknowledge that history and apologize. And then I think that we would be amazed uh, that the natives might actually, by earning their trust, be willing to help us to figure out what happened. Because who do you think understands and knows what happened <laughs> right. prior to the natives do, right? And as you've, as you've continued to investigate um, just, you know, the kind of polar controversy surrounding the runestone and, you know, even the discovery of other runestones, um, other yeah. kind of codex. Uh, what have you found as the most compelling aspect of it that gives that makes you continue to, you know, really believe and assert that, like, no, this is authentic and, and it deserves this kind of uh, continued investigation? Yeah. Well, it was the weathering. I mean, the geology and, you know, the geology, I, I trust rocks and I, I don't trust some people. And uh, that served as the foundation. And it serves in the foundation in all of these when I'm able to do geologic work on these inscriptions. And sometimes I can't, you know. One of the big problems that you run into, and, and archaeologists understand this very well, is that once you pull an artifact out of the ground, it's out of context, Right. And, you, you know, I mean, I, I, I believe when people tell me they found something, but unless you can prove it scientifically, there's always going to be that question. So if we have a clean chain of custody, if you will, or a clean provenance to these pieces, mm-hmm. the geology is, in my opinion, uh, not, you know, the least subjective aspect of the various things that you can investigate with these you know, carved stones or, or inscriptions or symbols carved on rock. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you bring up something that um, both Andrew and I find really fascinating and, and you have kind of a front row seat on um, in general. And that is that, you know, you really get to experiment with some of the cooler advancements in uh, new geological technology. You, you know, you're the inventor of a field. Um, you're somebody who kind of, you know, really pushes the forefront, whether it's, uh, you know, GPR or uh, various types of LIDAR, things like that. Can you tell uh, listeners a little bit about what uh, exciting advancements um, there are in kind of geotech and some of the things that you're uh, pushing the limits on these days? Well, there's there's a lot of things that are going on. I mean, the 3D uh, microscopic technology that we have introduced on the show is just fantastic. And, um, you know, depending on the situation, the artifact, what we're trying, what questions we're trying to answer, that technology is fantastic. LIDAR is amazing, and that technology continues to develop and advance uh, all the time, especially down in uh, heavily... Uh, <laughs> vegetated areas or, you know, in the jungles where there's a lot of vegetation, you know, it's almost impossible in some cases to get to these sites. And even when you're there, it's very difficult 
to really see and understand what you have. So being able to use LIDAR technology to actually strip away the vegetation is absolutely invaluable. Um, handheld uh, XRF technology to be able to get an elemental scan on various artifacts and, and different things just by holding it in your hand and looking at, and you'll see us use this in the first episode. I mean, that's, that's amazing technology, various types of um, radar technology. Um, uh, and when you talk about the XRF, um, just for the listeners, so you can use that to find different uh, minerality or, or different uh, constituent components of well, rock, it, right? It, it gives you an elemental breakdown of what the composition of that material is. Uh, by percentage. And so you can take that and you can figure out what the metals might be, what the rock type might be, what the secondary material might be, um, because you have an elemental breakdown by percentage. So um, that's just fantastic. And especially, so it's a really Especially useful handheld. Right? Handheld it's, is so it's cool. Deep. Yeah, it's yeah. handheld. It's amazing. Yeah. God bless the nerds pushing that ball <laughs> up the field, right? <laughs> so, Scott, I got to ask you, you mentioned a new book that's in the works a few times today. Um, tell us a little bit about that, right? What's what's the focus? Uh, you know, how far along in, in, in the, the writing process are you? When can we expect that thing to drop? Just, just hit us with a little bit of that. Well, uh, Knockwood, I think the book is going to press, being sent to the, uh, the press today. Oh really? So Boom. it's done. Yeah, I've been I've been working on I've been working on this book for about five years, and really hard in the last six months working with the editor and getting the photos in and making sure that you know all the you know mistakes are fixed. And sure. I think it's I think we're there, and I'm really excited about this book because as we talked about you know the symbolic allegorical aspects of of um, uh, some of these investigations that, that there are pieces of that that are part of these investigations, certainly with the runestone. And so I introduced this into the book. That's what the, the title refers to, the cryptic code. It was in one of the York Wright degrees uh, in the cryptic council degree, a group of degrees that I made a, a really important discovery. So uh, that really like I said, became the final missing piece uh, to help us fully understand the Kensington room stuff. Just bringing so, us first full circle. I love it. So, yep, Scott, yep. For, for our listeners that are, are intrigued and that, you know, they want to be able to, to follow your work, um, follow your journey, your show, the, the new books, everything that you're working on, what's the best way for people to, to track you down, right? Is it a website? Is it social media? How can they connect with you online? Well, um, you can certainly go to my blog site, um, scottwalteranswers.blogspot.com, and uh, I will be writing uh, blogs about every episode that we do. If you want to go back and look uh, all the episodes we already did, I wrote blogs for, and uh, I, I address people's questions, whether they're um, supporters or detractors. I mean, I've got plenty of people that don't like what we do. And as long as they uh, keep it civil, I'm happy to address their, their criticisms. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not perfect. Um, and, uh, you know, if we make a mistake and sometimes they catch us on something or they make a good point that I missed, um, um, that's great. And I'm, I'm happy to address it if they're going to be, uh, disrespectful and, <laughs> Uh, then they're going to get a short leash. Sure, sure. And I think that kind of engagement and just like your commitment to, to working with people and talking to people as it relates to your theories is, is a huge testament to just, you know, your personality in general, right? And so I think it's awesome that not only are you, you know, connecting with people about, you know, what they think could be valid with respect to your theories and your work, but like talking to them about, you know, maybe where they see holes or gaps. Um, I think that that's pretty amazing as well. And, and you know, it's, it's not Reddit, right? Like, those, those, that's where those dudes get mean. So they're, they're pretty gnarly. So, um. well, some of them, some of them get pretty nasty, but look, I, I don't expect everybody to agree with me. I don't expect people, everybody to like me. Um, you know, if, if, if you're really offended by the show or by me, change the channel. Um, and, and, but you know, on the other hand, some of the things that we have gotten into and we will continue to get into, um, you know, are really controversial and they challenge people's 
uh, faith in some cases. When right. we talk about Jesus and Mary Magdalene being married and being, you know, real people that lived 2,000 years ago, some people aren't prepared to deal with that and are, quite frankly, offended. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I'm not intentionally trying to offend anybody. I'm trying to get to the truth. Uh, but sometimes we get into sensitive areas, and I just want people to understand I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm just trying to figure it out. Right. And again, if you don't like it, you can turn the channel. Uh, people are free to believe what they want, but I'm also free to investigate what I want. And I just ask for them to respect my position as much as I understand and respect theirs. Right. I mean, you're not Scott rubbed the cat the wrong way, Walter. <laughs> you're Scott Walter, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> And, who sometimes rubs the cat the wrong way. <laughs> and Scott, for those who do uh, really want to tune in to this new season, um, I don't know if it's too early, but do you guys have uh, a release date for when this first episode is going to come out for people? Oh, who can... yeah, it's next Tuesday night. Next Tuesday uh, night, May America on Earth, May 28th. Yeah, May 28th. At, uh, it's, I think it's 10 o'clock Eastern, 9 o'clock Central Time. Right. And uh, Travel Channel. I'm, I'm thrilled. And, you know, I have to say one thing. Uh, Travel Channel has been immensely supportive, and um, they've been just great. I mean, it's it's um, you know I, I I was always treated well by History Channel, and I thank them for everything they did for us for three years. But this is a different experience. Um, Travel Channel is hitting it out of the park with um, all the support they've given us, and uh, um, and and the promotion of the show and. Uh, it's just been great. That's so. awesome. I'm glad that you found a found a team that, you know, really has the back and, and is helping you take this thing to the next level. And I know, you know, me just being a fan of your work, I, I'm personally excited just to dig into this new season and see the the journey and the, the adventures you go on and all the, the gnarly stuff that you you dig up out of the earth. And like you said, man, <laughs> just such cool, high quality production, really awesome, awesome team behind it. Obviously, you're going to be going to a lot of cool places, doing a lot of cool things. So hopefully uh, listeners and, and people that listeners know who would really love this stuff, uh, tune in next Tuesday or online or however people consume that stuff. But so exciting to get a new season. Yeah, we can't yeah. wait, Scott. Well, thank you so much for, for hopping on the horn with us today. I know that this is, you know, not the last time that we're going to be able to have you on the show. But as always, yeah. my friend, it's it's always good talking to you. You, you tell yeah. you tell your wife, Janet, that, that we say hello. We hope she's well. And uh, just thank you so much for, for making time for us today. Well, no problem. It's nice to meet you, CK, too. And I'm Same. sure you guys are going to have a lot of success with your venture here. And yeah, let's do it again soon. And um, hey, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. The thanks, pleasure's Scott. On. Oh, man. So awesome. Yeah, dude. That guy just, yeah, he blows my mind, man. Yeah. And he's so humble, you know, for somebody who yep. I think has access to the kind of things he has access to. Um, these kinds of resources, you know, for those who are going to watch the episode uh, when it drops next week, like there's just considerable uh, energy behind what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And it's so cool that he's got a network of other experts that he can tap. Um, really thoughtful guy, really deep rabbit hole in terms of how potentially the Vikings and their presence in North America could change some of the timelines as we understand it. Yeah. Um, and I know he, you know, he got into it a little bit, but for those who are going to watch the episode, there's some really interesting stuff about, you know, how did they get here? Right. Where did they go? When did they, when get here? did they get here? Yeah. And so that stuff I think will be really interesting for the listeners to dig into when it drops. Yeah. And I'm really excited to see just like the overall like schedule of content for this season. I mean, he talked about going to some really gnarly places and yep. being able to dig into some really cool stuff and yeah, it, it'll be It'll be awesome to watch his journey. We definitely have to get him back on the show, like maybe towards the tail end of the season, just to do kind of a follow up and see. Such a thoughtful you know, yeah, guy. I, th I think so too. So next week, dude, who going to be such a good show. Um, another veteran from season one coming back, Scott Crichton, uh, hands down, like one of my favorite human beings. This guy is just like the happiest, friendliest, uh, like just Scottish. Scottish. Yeah. And he's, he's really, really solid. Just an, an amazing guy to talk to. And a lot of his work, you know, focuses on, on the pyramids at Giza um, and just kind of the, the narrative in which we've been, you know, fed as it relates to like, how were they built? What was, what were their purpose? Uh, like there's a lot of gaps in, in that timeline. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, there's a lot of crazy theories out there about, you know, were they, uh, I mean, like power plants and stuff. And Talked it, about that last season. Yeah, exactly. And I, I don't mean to say crazy theories, right? I'm just saying like a, a little bit outside of what, you know, most people would would expect to see when they, they look at this uh, megalithic structure or whatnot. Sure. But um, the way he approaches it is really interesting. His books are such solid reads. Like he he walks you through a story, which is cool. It's It's not like reading you know, some ancient mysteries or history books where, you know, it can get a little dry at times. Sure. His is very much like a narrative and it, and it keeps you along for the ride. So he did just have a new book come out uh, called The Great Pyramid Hoax. Uh, I'll just read you like the first paragraph of the synopsis here. This is, uh, despite millennia of fame, the origins of the Great Pyramid of Giza are shrouded in mystery. Believed to be the tomb of an Egyptian king, even though no remains have ever been found, its construction date of roughly 2550 BCE is tied to only one piece of evidence, the crudely painted marks within the pyramid's hidden chambers that refer to the fourth dynasty King Khufu discovered in 1837 by Colonel Howard Weiss and his team. And it's those markings that he really digs into and he's poking at, are they legit, right? Like, mm-hmm. or are these um, like created? to help substantiate, you know, a discovery or whatever. And so that show is going to be a lot of fun uh, for anybody out there. If you guys have questions for Scott, you know, hit us on social media or, or poke us through the website so we can get those worked into into the episode. We'd love, you know, you guys to, to hit us with what, what you're curious to, to discover. So psyched for that. Yeah, it's going to be good stuff. So make sure that you guys tune in next week for our episode with Scott Crichton. Until then, I'm Andrew. I'm CK. And we challenge you to question everything. 